Welcome to episode 100 of the In General podcast. We finally made it. My name is Jack from Dress Scout Post, and I'm joined with a cease. What's up, yeah. buddy? Yeah, episode 100, guys, finally. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm also joined with Chris. Week. Chris likes dinos. I'm not sure if anybody's aware of who he is. He's a bit of an like like anonymous source in the community. But Chris likes dinos. How are you? Nice to see you. True. Right? Shorter hair than usual, too. <laughs> it's not that short. It's just tied up. <laughs> He's hiding his hair. By the way, guys, for those who can't see, because no one can see his audio podcast, but Chris is literally. <laughs> for those who can't see. <laughs> yeah, Chris is literally sitting in somewhere where it looks like he's out in the field where I would work, and this guy has his computer on like a gun case. It's very strange. It is. It's it's the new world we live in. Speaking of that, new that, worlds, dinosaur. talking about a new dinosaur world. To be clear, Jurassic Dominion, <laughs> not, not reflective Jurassic of the, the real guys. world. Guys, the trailer's out. <laughs> the, the trailer is out. <laughs> Before we talk about everything that's so exciting, uh, it's been a while since episode 99, we should mention. Uh, we've had a little hiatus, but it was planned. Like a week or two. We wanted to, <laughs> just a week or two, we wanted to wait until the trailer dropped before we did episode 100. And it's been a while since the trailer dropped, but we had a long time trying to align our schedules. We're all very busy people, but we are here. It's episode 100, the original trio, same people that started it all. Uh, episode one, which I would also advise not listening to. Yeah, I would say go I don't know why we still have those online. Twenty, what's that? Twenty fourteen. Twenty fourteen was that podcast? JurassicWorld.org dot org podcast. Jurassic World dot org. But hey, it's exciting. Before we go on though, twenty percent discount with a new partner, Ewin Racing. Uh, they sell gaming chairs. They're actually really comfortable chairs. You can get twenty percent discount using uh, code Outpost. So check the description. All right, let's talk about the trailer. Let's do it. I love it. I still love it. I've sat on still it. Love thought it. About it. Still love it. Still love it. No, it it honestly it's the first time I liked a Jurassic World trailer. That's not reflective of the movies. I just never nope. liked the way the trailers were cut as trailers and it's the first I would time say I best liked trailer. One. I agree with you. This is the Very best trailer we've gotten so far. I think a lot of people are in agreement that the marketing for the Jurassic World and, and more so Fallen Kingdom was was not great in terms of it spoiled a lot of the movies. So this was a great trailer to open with. It showed you a lot. But it didn't a little more than I would have liked. It but didn't tell you a lot. Yeah. And I like think that's why I liked it so much. Is because I still don't know what the movie's about. I mean, we all do, right? But <laughs> I don't know what the movie's about from spoilers that trailer. Spoilers. I just know that visually, it's going to be a great movie. And it looks like it's got some really great scenes. Um, what was the standout thing to you in the trailer? The one scene for you that was like... I think I speak for a lot of people when I say this, but it has to be granted, Ellie. It's always been, it always will be. They'll, that's going to be the star of the show, I think. Everyone wants to go see it. That's worth the price of admission alone. Forget about the dinosaurs. It's all were about they in, um, weren't they the, Were they the ones that were in the originals? Or? Jurassic Park 2. I, yeah, Jurassic Park 2. Yeah, I haven't seen the originals. I've only seen Jurassic World. Jurassic Park 2, the, the chaos one. continues. Great game. <laughs> Do you remember when Colin was... It's funny, because Colin, didn't he tweet a picture of him playing circle. that whole like, game? research research and it didn't For two movies later yeah yeah dominion I mean, it's funny it looks from like this it. trailer it definitely if you cut out jurassic world and fallen kingdom it would still kind of make sense you could there'd be a lot of loose ends but you could tie I, some it, stuff up with some soft rewrites dominion you know, could be jp4 jumping ahead of it myself Jumping ahead of myself, and this is really jumping ahead of myself. I, I don't think he wears a hat, and I'm just thinking the how he did say he was like kind of doing a lot of deep research on it. Um, for Dominion, there's a new toy, Rain Delacour. Rain Delacour. Rain Delacour. Uh, Rain. <laughs> we've seen him in Lego form, and we've seen him in Mattel form now. And uh, you know what I realized? <laughs> he kind of looks like without. I mean, he's wearing a shirt, but you know what he kind of looks like is uh, Doctor Snare from the Evil Raiders. Oh, he does. Oh, speaking does. of evil, my connection dropped. Do you have one? Oh, he's been irresponsible lately. Yeah. He... In spirit of Jurassic World Dominion, of course, guys. I Wait. have to get one of these guys. Whoa. I'm holding up for those who can't see. Oh, you got Skinner. <laughs> got Skinner. He's holding up a MIP, M-I-B, M-O-C, Mock, uh, yeah. evil, Jurassic Fresh. Park, Evil Raiders, Series First 1. one ever. 10 out of 10. I would say 10 condition Skinner, and he just dropped it in front of us. I'm welcome. <laughs> I opened it, too. I'm opening it. Live unboxing. Uh, yeah, just ripping into it. Uh, I'm just saying, like, just hear this horrible. I'm just saying, like, like, 
the fact that the trailer has gotten me so back into Jurassic where I'm dropping like ridiculous amounts of money like on things like Skinner just to have it like sitting. <laughs> like I have like my entire like dinosaur thing over there. Like I'm so hyped about this trailer. This thing has like reinvigorated my love for Jurassic and I'm so all about it. Yeah. That's exciting, man. That's really exciting. Cause it's yeah, I think it's no joke that anybody that listens is is aware that the three of us People have our own. Yeah. We have different opinions about the Jurassic World movies, but many of us have kind of fallen off or just not as excited about them. But this trailer did also for me the same thing. It, it kind of got me excited, pulled me back in. I was like, okay, fine, <laughs> fine. <laughs> I will go and see Dominion. <laughs> you know, it had the tone that it needed also. It just wasn't that it looked good, which it did look good. And it wasn't that it was doing a lot of things that we wanted. It was also just the tone felt like very true You're and so celebratory right. so of right. Jurassic Park. And I think that it that is feel like that Jurassic just... Park. Yeah. It, it doesn't it feel like, like Jurassic World. Yeah, it feels, I mean, it's different than Jurassic Park. It's huge. It's grand, but oh, it also sure. just feels the tonal resonance with it all seems like it's taking itself seriously. It seems like it's taking itself, like it realizes that these things are, well, animal like dinosaurs are animals and they're yeah, just these magnificent creatures. And also it just seems like it recognizes that this franchise is something special. And it just, it's, it seemed to learn from the Star Wars trailers, if that makes sense. It yeah, definitely, definitely has a Star got- Wars vibe. Yeah, I got similar vibes. Uh, you know, I'm not a big Star Wars guy, but when I saw the Force Awakens trailer, I got really excited as if I had been a Star Wars fan all this time. It was a really great trailer to pull you in. Um, and I, I got similar feelings from this trailer. It pulled me in regardless of like what I thought about the movies that it was following. Just was excited. It seemed really yeah. cool. And you, you mentioned before about, you know, stunning visually. Mm-hmm. Um, John Schwartzman, cinematographer, master cinematographer in Hollywood. However, you know, personally, I don't consider him much of an auteur in the sense of, uh, like, he's not very Flora. flat. It's pretty Hollywood blockbustery. <laughs> There's no real style. Like, you could watch his film and not immediately know that's a John Schwartzman. Whereas it's different for people like Roger Deakins, you know. Um, yeah. But regardless, he seems to have elevated a hell of a lot in this film. Like he seems to be shooting it like a proper Jurassic. Now nothing looks yeah. like Jurassic world. It looks way more like fallen kingdom, but less Gothic. It's got its own style. And uh, that's something I'm really excited for. Yeah. Visually, it looks fantastic. Like, yeah, I mean this, this guy figured it out. Colin has obviously worked very closely with John Swatchman on this one. Um, I would hope they've, so. they've refined a relationship. It seems because that it's paid off whatever they've done. It feels like they world was. they knew they what they wanted evolved. their visual storytelling to be on this one. Where Jurassic World, right. I think they just kind of you know maybe they kind of took they kind of were against the fence and had to go and run with it. Um, but this movie feels very confident. It feels like it knows what it wants to be. Um, and visually, yeah, like you said, it seems to have taken some elements from Fallen Kingdom. I'd say it looks better than Fallen Kingdom because Fallen Kingdom is a very good looking movie. But I just always felt that sometimes the visuals worked against the scene rather than serve the scene. Um, and from I know it's just a trailer, but everything I've seen seems to serve the scene rather than work against it. Yeah, it really I, does I, feel it's so like... funny because Fallen Kingdom, the way Bayona shot it, felt like a Bayona movie, but sure. tonally the movie felt like a comedy. And and you have you know Chris Pratt wailing and running and flailing his arms running out the jungle, be, run, 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 you know, when the eruption to- mm-hmm. tonally is completely off and it doesn't fit the cinematography. It's almost as if you could switch the cinematographers or the cinematography on Jurassic world and fallen kingdom. And it would fit more. Cause at least Colin was trying to make okay. a Jurassic movie, you mm-hmm. know, feel like a Jurassic movie. If it had looked a little deeper and darker and not so bright in the forests and jungles, maybe it would have, That's blue. Jurassic world, maybe it would have been even better. Uh, Fallen Kingdom was just kind of a silly movie at parts. And yeah, the cinematography really did, especially the the, the full, you know, anamorphic crop they had going for it. Um, yeah, it was just, I don't know why they switched but... switched the formula up with the, uh, the aspect ratio so much. I just don't think it serves dinosaurs, which are traditionally just tall. Yeah, and I mean, you point. can... It's a good point. Bayona claims to be a massive Spielberg fan. I'm not doubting that he is, but like, surely he would have looked at why he shot Jurassic in the way he shot Jurassic. They didn't use anamorphic lens for certain reasons. They didn't use, um, you know, cinematic crops for certain reasons. It was all about dinosaurs and perspective. And it pays off and it worked. And the whole franchise stayed that way. Fair enough, Colin, to change it. Two to one is that now the, the more mainstream aspect ratio is what a lot of Netflix stuff does. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but yeah, the, the change for Fallen Kingdom, I'm like a huge fan of, of Cinema Crop, mm-hmm. 235 to 1, 239 to 1. But no, I don't know. I just didn't need it in Jurassic. <laughs> it didn't It didn't look right because Spielberg <laughs> had established that look so early on. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, it's, there's it, something it about does the annoy top. me a little bit like that it changes. It's just like a personal thing, especially this one's going back two to one. So you're going to have one movie that's just odd. It's just odd. odd. Really? Just that's always been Jurassic, though. Like, Jurassic Park 3 never fit really with Jurassic Park 1 and Lost But they World. were all cropped the same. <laughs> they that's were true. all 5 like, to 1. Technically. Oh, so, whoa, technical. whoa, whoa. Assis, Assis is saying JP3 doesn't really fit with the other two. Now that. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. <laughs> I, I, I just want to highlight, just wanna highlight a- that. That's a podcast first. You heard that. Well, we should tell him. Uh, what's his name? What's movie. his Twitter handle? Stuck on sauna. Daniel, we should tell him. <laughs> You've lost Assis. Assis. Assis is no longer in the club. <laughs> Can you imagine if that were the case? I would. My entire identity as a Jurassic Park fan would be erased. Kicked out of the I would have nothing. <laughs> There's like um, four of us left. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what's funny? As time has gone on, I don't necessarily. I haven't really changed my opinions on JP3 as a whole. But as time has gone on, I have been able to really appreciate the elements that I like about it. Um, And I I think that you can tell the elements that they knew what they wanted to do. And like, it's the same with Fallen Kingdom, honestly. Like, I haven't, I haven't warmed on that film, but there are elements in that film that I very much resonate with. It's just as a film, it doesn't work. I don't think there are elements. I mean, you have a ton of talent working on that movie. J.A. is an incredibly talented, Mm -hmm. and talented and incredibly <laughs> talented, talented. Real fans. Real fans. <laughs> and incredibly talented director oscar for is an incredibly talented cinematographer yeah. um you know yeah and, and some is, of the gothic stuff that we got in fallen kingdom very is unique so welcomed cool. in the franchise like yeah having, yeah it's not just a dinosaur there's a hybrid freak showing it with gothic cinematography that really echoes that like a lot of Guillermo you know, del Toro vibe. aspects yeah I, del Toro vibes. i love that yeah that's they yeah, have his own like, sensibilities to it i like that it really yeah. works when it enters the bedroom and you have like the shadow of it mm-hmm. and then it's creeping under the bed. I think that that all really, really worked. It seems to fall apart during the action scenes. And then sometimes the cinematography just gets very, very lavish for the, um, but hey, yeah, we're not here to talk about Fallen Kingdom. <laughs> yeah, we could. <laughs> we could. Discuss we could. All these movies. I think we always is- end up on Fallen Kingdom. It's like this. There's it like this to be Jurassic World. Now it's Fallen Kingdom. I think it will always be unresolved as well. I think we'll always Un- feel pain from that movie. We have a very special Unfinished history business. with that movie, though. Very special Just, history. It's well, Fun. yeah. I mean, when we all first saw that movie together, we were very lucky in, in an opportunity to see it. Yeah, it was, it was cool. We um, there was a really weird time, and it was very. It was like five a.m. I think we finished. And yeah, it was something very ridiculous. We watched it early, a little bit earlier. I'm not. We we saw it together, luckily. Um, and it was. We all turned to each other at one point. We were like, uh oh. Oh, had the same reaction. You we paused like, at one point. We were like, four Yikes. or five Jurassic fans sat in a room together, and you're like, oh, here's the new movie. And you're showing them, and the, the buzz and the adrenaline is going crazy in that room. And then the, the, it's like a balloon deflating instantly. It just, just dropped. Yeah. The mood in the it, room just kept going down. <laughs> right down. after the. Cr- like the DPG, it was as soon as we got to Lockwood Manor. I think yep. you just kind of under your breath, you go, "It's too fast. It's just, it's, it's going too fast." Again. And it's just like it was like I immediately got sucked out of the movie because everything was like whoa, 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 and I was yeah. like, "Wow!" I now realize I'm in in a room sitting with people because I can't resonate this movie. And we're like, "Okay, we'll get better." Then see Chris, John Alfred you- Hammo, hey, Hammo. Yeah, you guys really <laughs> did not like that. Chris is hammered today. It seems I I'm saw you just. Swinging. Mm-hmm. Yeah. the tired boy he's been working hard popping pills working yeah, hard. that's it that's it but it's true no, but it's true uh, that, it was the the alfred hammond thing for, we all turned and looked at each other on the sofa isn't it parker oh. alex goes it's parker <laughs> <laughs> oh, no but it's funny you mentioned that the fact that you felt that the lost world was moving too quickly i have my only reservation that i have with excuse me probably fallen, kingdom? fallen kingdom fallen kingdom sorry fallen King. the lost world moving fast enough if we're all being please? I apologize to all the, the fans of Jurassic Park 2, the best movie. Sorry, guys, don't worry. I got it. Sorted this yeah. one out. Representative Jack's on it. Um, <laughs> but it's funny because the fact that Jurassic World Dominion is showing us all these like extravagant locations. We're going to be traveling. We're going to be globetrotting. We haven't done that in a Jurassic World movie really before, or Jurassic Park even. So it's giving me kind of concern that we'll be moving too quickly through set pieces and locations just to get to the next action scene, similar to The Fallen Kingdom. And that's my only reservation that I kind of hold. 
on the mini, and I know I'm not alone in that. I've spoken to some other friends too on Twitter and on the Facebook, and people hold the same thing. It, it feels too much, too quick, just to get to the next scene. You know, like, like the Raptor chase. It's like okay, skip some character stuff. We gotta get to Malta. We gotta get these dinosaurs loose. It's like it feels like that kind of. Does that make sense? So going on your point there, uh, one of the things that I said really early on, and I remember saying this like very close after Fallen Kingdom, is uh, this movie, you know, because I, I said Fallen Kingdom feels like two movies stitched together. I, yeah. I, I remember saying, and I bet we could probably find it. Probably. I remember saying uh, Dominion is going to feel like, a, you know, 10 movies, and it's going to feel like the last jason bourne movie where it was just like yeah. paris and then two minutes later london and then like you're just traveling Spain, the whole wherever time, else just yeah flying and just traveling in different locations you have no really time Mission with Impossible. any actual characters and you're just kind of flying through the story and that's my worry for dominion especially with the runtime mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh the, yes we don't know the Very what's the final registered runtime do we actually know that we don't know we don't know we know it's shorter it's than what they test we, they cut it though yeah they cut it down over the summer but, but this, we don't this know this is exactly. my concern because like here we go right so i know they film a lot of stuff a lot of stuff ends up on the cutting room floor with movies right we all understand the, so mo- that's the movie for the better making. yeah we all understand the movie making process right and some directors like michael bay they shoot for the edit some directors write their script and direct in order to make like Spielberg to make a film that they fucking wrote, you know, like or some, the Batman for the most, like most current example, the Batman. most of your fucking yeah. script ends up somewhere in the fucking movie. Right. But you have most of the people that have worked on dominions are like Sam. Oh, we shot a six hour movie and obviously didn't shoot a six hour movie, but like most of them said, probably, like yeah. we really do we have a, big a movie. huge a big movie here and it's going to be like two hours. Maybe an hour, maybe between two or four, probably yeah, some, something something usual. But I would say somewhere around the usual. Be yeah, as long like as the script was written for, and that's a huge concern because you have a three-hour script, and yeah, okay, you can cut down some pacing, but then you cut down too much pacing and you end up with Fallen Kingdom. Fallen Kingdom, or you cut out too much context. Like, well, we'll cut out all the scenes with this person. It's okay, but that like literally answers loads of different questions here. Like. It, that's a really tough one to get down, and I'm gonna be surprised if this movie is paced well. That's my only yeah. concern with it. I'm really yeah. excited for certain scenes, like the Claire scene, which we have to talk about with the swamp and stuff. How exciting is that scene? Oh my be? god, yes! But I'm so worried that it's gonna be set up. It's gonna be so slow, and then it's just gonna like, oh, one thing happens, and then boom, we're somewhere else, and it's gone. It's so, gone. yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. Movies can have a like. I mean, the board, like you brought up the born point. And that's a really good point. Because those movies are not good. Um, I know. <laughs> like, I'm just... Those movies wish... Too. Those movies wish they could be Mission Impossible or Bond. There's elements that... Well, the earlier ones are good. But as they went on, they yes, became yeah. progressively mm. worse. Um, I, I should say. And they be, they got, like, too high on themselves. And they're just like, oh, what... Isn't it... We got to keep it quick. We got to keep it big. We got to keep it wild. And they just lost any sense of like resonating tone and any sense of investment because like you just get whiplash. You're just jumping around. No scene resonates. Uh, Especially on the that side, last one it, where you're yeah. you, literally, it's like mm-hmm. global. Yes. It's a globe trotting adventure, but every single scene. That's is the issue like, with globe trotting adventure. Afghanistan and stuff. And you're just like, what the <laughs> fuck is happening? It's like, yeah, it's, it's all also, over the place. Well, what's scary, that's also like what ha- is happening to the uh, Fast and the Furious movies, which like I've never been huge universal on, property, but no, I've been able to. Space. In, I've never been huge they've on them, to but space, I've been able to enjoy them for what they are. But like they've yeah. gotten abysmal. They've gone too much. Again. But yeah, in, in a sense, and that's there's obviously that other worry it, there. It's Jurassic again Universal would want to stop cross. Well, my worry is that, anytime but... these smooth these shows, these movies, they try to get larger. They're like, oh, we have to up the ante. It's like they sometimes get so caught up on the idea of like how many like okay we had it's like in harry potter when dudley's like but last how many presents have i got so it's like they get like how many action scenes do we have how many dinosaurs do we have last time last time we had this like many that. and it's it's like they get so caught up on the number that they they just forget about like well how good is it and don't yeah. get me wrong i'm sure everybody making the movie is like well how good is it but the problem is is you're gonna have outside influence being like Yes, this seems really cool, but can you trim it in half and add another action scene in with something else? That's where the worry be, uh, hits, because also for us as an audience to resonate, what would it be like being chased by dinosaurs? The longer we can spend in one context, in one se- scene with one animal, the longer we can sort of... That's why Jurassic Park is so successful, man. 
you don't spend like a long time with like dinosaurs like the t-rex the t-rex scene it's like what 10 minutes long almost like the entire attack yeah whereas mm-hmm. like what the indominus breakout is like what a minute two minutes so yeah, indominus breakout like, to be fair, is paced pretty well like i remember true, when true. Yeah, I'm just, say, like, I the very you're saying, quick. totally agree with you. Yeah. But that scene, to be fair, is like one of Colin's really. It is a good scene. scene. It is a good scene. I'm just saying, like things just move too fast. I remember. I do. Us Alan, saying like, that feels very Jurassic. The way it was, like you're cutting back to the control room and back to the, the Indominus paddock. That was all very cool. My concern yeah. about what you were saying, Chris, is that, um, you know, you they're introducing so many new dinosaurs in this, which is fine. Whatever. I do think it's probably too many for one movie, but uh, I think introducing those dinosaurs is great but if you're not going to spend time with them what's the point right therizinosaurus i know we know that that has more scenes because of some of the toy sets that have been revealed but imagine if the therizinosaurus was only in it for the claire scene right and they were cutting the pacing and they cut some things out so you see a therizinosaurus which is the most fucked up looking dinosaur you could imagine it's an insane species and it's so cool they're bringing this to the screen and you're like seeing it creep through the jungle it's paced perfectly and you can see like little bits of it you see the claws as they're revealed you see its you know uh feet stomping down you see its beak or whatever the fuck it yeah is it's got. a beak <laughs> um and and you, you know slowly revealed you spend time with it and then you realize it's a two minute scene you're out of the scene and you never see the dinosaur again imagine the same thing happens with the pyroraptor when they're standing Which there with the knives yeah. and tasers or whatever it is and you see the pyroraptor in that scene and then you never see the pyroraptor again like I'm Probably worried dies in about that, that because you you introduce the spinosaurus and yeah, Jurassic Park 3 and it hunts them the entire movie. You know, same with the raptors. It's, they're always it's kind present. Of it's this big... We're, we finally, like, yeah, okay, in the case of, like, the pyroraptor, we finally have feathered raptors. This has been a thing that has basically been introduced from the very beginning of Jurassic Park. We are introduced with Dr. Grant talking about feathered velociraptors, talking about their relationship to birds. So this is a big deal, and the Jurassic Park franchise has been building to this slowly with the Jurassic Park 3 raptors sporting quills, and then more conversations happening during the Jurassic World films talking about feathers and like these animals looking different. Big so we're animals, finally there. Yeah. Bringing the pyroraptor in is a big deal and a very big payoff. So, I mean, I really do hope... Uh, yeah, like it's one of those animals. It's like this thing absolutely needs to be present in the film because it is a big deal. So I hope we get a pack of them. I hope we get to see male and female pyroraptors the way we've seen male and female velociraptors in the past. I hope Grant gets a scene with them because that's a big deal. That's a big and deal. And I think same with the Therizinosaurus, the Quetz, being a flying reptile, that one almost makes sense that you wouldn't see it present all the time because you yeah imagined, and, and yeah some dinosaurs some of the species that they're introduced not everything can be there dinosaurs. all the time it doesn't need a feature i'm not saying you know we need like but chris the made a pretty good point for the around, after, though you know the egg thief but it, it's just like some of the bigger ones the therizinosaurus although we do know that does have more of us that does come into play a lot more which is great right so that has i mean we, one would hope yeah i'd hope I'll so cut it. yeah I mean, I would imagine. <laughs> Unless they cut it, they cut the whole scene with Claire. Like, it just is not there. Um, <laughs> so, talking about the trailer, out of, that's my favorite scene. Which is yours? Ah, uh, my favorite scene. Jeez, yeah. that's the one thing in the trailer. Like, at least this was Grant Nelly, right? And I it everybody can understand that. And we will talk yeah. about that because that's exciting. But like it's the one thing deal. you were like that that that's the reason I'm going to see this movie. That thing. I'm right surprised there. it's not the feathered raptor, honestly. Well, I mean, like that—that's a favorite element. But I have a lot. Like he knew seeing... that ahead of time. I get like we a lot of people knew about the pyro raptor. Yeah, we knew that was so... coming. But like seeing but the it, the fact that was... it looks as good as it does. Yeah, I mean, like from the back end, its head looks a little weird. But then from like the other shots we've seen, where it looks like front on from the front when it's charging, it looks fantastic. All the feathers look fantastic. I think it looks, it looks yeah, it looks it, really. Cool. I've always said feathers would work, but even me seeing that, I'm like, wow, it works better than I even imagined. Yeah, they sold exactly... me on it, man. This is exactly what I hope for, for them to do something unique with feathers. And it's cool seeing something like the Pyroraptor and the Atrociraptor, both in a new movie. where they're both scratches both two, itches for everyone. They're both on two opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah. You know, Velociraptors are right in the middle. They're sort of like Komodo Dragon inspired. But the Atrociraptors are like spiky. They're like almost like bearded dragons, some of their influence. You know, like they've got like these weird spikes they're underneath their looking. chins. They're, all their skin is very molted and pebbly and spiky. And they're just a lot more reptilian rather than leathery. And then you have the Pyroraptor, which again, I mean, this thing is a dinosaur bird. Um, it's got a dinosaur head, but it's got, you know, it's got these claws, these feet, but it's fully feathered. It's 
beautiful it's you know mm-hmm. vibrant colored i don't know it's just something cool about seeing that but before my favorite scene <laughs> yes we get so, so sidetracked <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> we get so okay. sidetracked um that's really tough i do think that the scene that just like hit me in the gut in the best possible way though is right when you see dr grant and the music plays heck it, yes it, it's it, it's that it's hard to say like what a favorite scene is especially without seeing the movie but like seeing that dr grant scene there absolutely um seeing ellie back a hundred percent but there's mm-hmm. something just about dr grant, dr. grant that yeah. feels like he it, in a lot of ways he's always been the because he's so tied to the dinosaurs that I think he's always been a little bit of the heart of this franchise um, because yeah, he's, he's sort of like, like the fans. He enjoys yeah. it. But he's sort of cynical. He he's invested <laughs> in the dinosaurs. He knows more about the dinosaurs than everybody else. He's a scientist. Um, than like the people making, he knows more about the dinosaurs than the people making the dinosaurs. He very much is like a really good parable for the fans in a lot of way. And he's got a lot of heart and he's kind of a little dry. He's a little moody, but also can get into it anyhow. Like, I don't know. It's kind of a funny it's a character that we know and love Mm -hmm. and the fact that he's back it's it's exciting for everyone i think like that's such a like how many times as a kid when we when we were all young we're all the same age roughly how many times did you ever think about the jurassic park 4 with like that specific scene older grant older ellie older come on malcolm are you kidding me like oh you did it you did it talk about fucking jurassic park 4 let's do it man this is a jurassic park 4 Uh, jurassic world dominion is jurassic park 4 honestly it feels like it's just got it's just got the taintedness of of the jurassic world movies which for me they're not canon so i'm deciding (laughs) jurassic world's a good movie i i went back and forth on jurassic world a lot i think i agree i like it I, like I agree. It. I like it, it, I'm ending the podcast now. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I like Jurassic World. It's got issues, but I like it overall. Yeah, um, it's I've, it, you know, it, it is funny. We say, and a lot of people say, that Jurassic Park 3 grew on them after the Jurassic World movies. Whether that's a positive or a negative for the Jurassic World movies doesn't matter. You know, the, the more time has gone on, people have found those movies. It's like the prequels too with Star Wars. I don't love Jurassic World, and I don't think that will change. And I really don't love Fallen Kingdom, but I think the further we have got from Jurassic World, and the you know longer we've had Fallen Kingdom in existence, Jurassic World definitely is better for me than Fallen Kingdom. And like You're more before accepting I said, of it, yeah. that scene, like you know the breakout of the Indominus Rex, I was like, that is a fucking good scene, though. Like mm-hmm, there sure. are elements of Jurassic World that are really good, and uh, I understand like <laughs> that would that would would have been a tough one to make as a new you know, quote unquote, new director in Hollywood working for one of the largest Spielberg franchises for a studio yeah. like Universal. That's a tough gig, a really tough gig in today's uh, industry, or at least in 2015's industry. It is, um, it, Jurassic World, one of my biggest issues with it is like, okay, we're finally seeing an open park. Like we are seeing a park filled with dinosaurs that is open. And we, and like, you see these little hints of these really grand things in this park that we don't actually get to see and we don't get set pieces you know the set pieces become very traditionally jurassic park like immediately and my kind of takeaway is like well you've got an open park you have this really extravagant location it will always feel a little bit like a missed opportunity for me that they didn't fully lean into like jurassic park the game like into some of those locations that's a good point, Chris. into that's a, the that's concept. It's a very interesting way of looking at it. I like I Jurassic thought about World, it like that. and I think the budget is what, because if we if you've seen the storyboards that they've done and some of the concept art, you'll see things. They're planning stuff around the rise. Like, wow, this is like like the intro of the movie where you get yeah. to fly through through all the exhibits and there's the boat going through the Plesiosaur Lake and all these exhibits. And then we hear like, yeah, they had to cut it down because of budget. And it, it will forever it hurt sense. that we didn't get to spend more time in Jurassic World. But all the same, I still think some of the actions sequences um some of the more like just the gyrosphere with the ankylosaur and the uh um indominus um scene i almost feel like that could have taken place in something that really leans into like this is a open park setting i don't know i don't exactly know i always said i mean you have this underwater viewing and this is a very like silly superficial thing but like you have this underwater viewing atrium where you have these tunnels going through underwater and you have the Mosasaurus swimming in the background. I just don't know how we never had a shot of like a raptor walking through with the Mosasaurus know, right? slowly. But here's like, the thing, though, Chris. Like just you know, like shot, shot like a Deacon shot. So like the raptor's walking through, it's oh, backlit it's from this moody blue lighting filtering through as it's like walking through the tunnel. You can just barely around. make out it's the Mosasaur. Like, yeah. The Mosasaur's like kind of 
like swimming through and it's just like one of these moments of you're like oh this is this is wild and they these talk to things. each other and like they nod and talk to each other yeah yeah then then they wink oh, at each I other like the ending of jurassic world and they talk to each yeah. other oh, well, I, rem- I remember us talking on the podcast <laughs> it's a very specific thing but uh, it's just an example i remember yeah i remember us talking on podcasts leading up to the re- release i remember being in favor of i hope the third act takes place in the tunnels the underground tunnels of new block because why wouldn't they you know that makes sense you know Owen's got to escape and get these kids safely off the island. The rest of the island's evacuated, but the island's now populated with dinosaurs. What's he going to do? He's going to go in the tunnels. That's what would have been cool. <laughs> I remember I had so many... I guess Jurassic World was always going to be a tough one, right? 14, 15 years of, of, of all these anticipations from, from Yeah, it's fans. tough. Too much expectations. It's, it's a good never going to fit. Word. Expectations. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, Here's the thing, though, Chris. You guys keep mentioning this. It's, it's interesting because... Now I forgot my train of thought. Damn it. I love oh, it. yes. It's Colin. Colin, he did as good as he could with <laughs> Jurassic World. And I think he did a good job. The fact that it did as well, as successful as it was, and, it, you know, kicked off the Jurassic World franchise again and brought it back into the limelight. Um, they've always talked about, or correct me if I'm wrong here, but they've always talked about how Jurassic World Dominion is the movie that they set out to make when they first signed on to the project many, many years ago. So I guess I could kind of forgive Jurassic World uh, and uh, Fallen Kingdom to a sense. It's kind of a stepping stone if Jurassic World Dominion is as good of a movie as we're expecting. I'm totally I'm, okay with being like Fallen Kingdom was fine and Jurassic World was a stepping stone to get us to this point, and I'm totally okay with it if we get the third movie to be amazing. I'm fair. Okay I mean, I, I definitely understand, although I still think that those movies, if this was always the end game, those movies didn't really set it up at all. They didn't um, set it up well as well as they could have, for sure, but that, we can talk about the execution of the past two movies. We've done that f- at nauseum at this point. It's kind yeah, of a crap, I think crap trilogy is, when you think about it. It feels like want. different people wrote every movie because they don't yeah. really lead it, into yeah, the next one. It does feel that one. way, doesn't it? They, it's, it's strange to me that it's been the same team behind all of these movies because they really do feel slightly disjointed. They don't follow on one another's sort of like hooks in the way that you'd expect. I wonder if they actually had a plan. You know how like Star Wars kind of didn't really have a plan for the sequel? I, I wonder if Jurassic World had like a, a rougher idea, but didn't have it like sequenced out properly as they should have. I think I the plan was, was to get some dinosaurs off the island, to get the movies off the island. Yeah. I think that was I mean, about the extent of the plan. Um, yeah, I, I think that, I think they made the decision early on that hey let's kind of revisit the concept of jurassic park on the island kind of revisit nostalgia and familiarity see if this works before we just jump into the dinosaurs being off the islands um i think you have to do that unfortunately you have to do that yeah and i mean i still think you have to do that i still think the idea of jurassic world being an open park is a pretty cool idea i don't think that it was executed on entirely as like I don't think they used that unique setting as well as they could have because they sort of just did another Jurassic Park, sort of. Yeah, I Um, guess. But I I, I think it's still a standalone movie. What I'm saying is it doesn't necessarily lean into the promises of an open park. And the other thing is, is, you know, we're established Jurassic World as part of this global entity. So you think we would have heard about other locations. And when Fallen Kingdom started, we would have found out about other global locations. And I think that that would have helped the ball roll a little bit more than dinosaurs spreading across the world a little bit more. And also, it just would have followed up on that promise of like, oh, this is what it's like when it was a success. Like when Jurassic Park, if Jurassic Park were a success, it would have expanded and it would have grown. And the thing is, is after Jurassic World, you could almost forget that Jurassic World ever existed. And just jump into fall. Here's the thing, though, Chris. They did set it up, though. But I, like I said, you're right. They didn't set it up as well as it should have. But like in Fallen Kingdom, Wu does have that line where he's like, uh, or like Mills, someone's like, "Oh, we'll make another one." But then Wu does say, "Oh, so will they." So there is some sort of like. Uh, maybe it wasn't set up properly, but there's some sort of perception that other people do have the capability of doing so now. Well, that's just because they were then auctioning off everything. Like okay, that was yeah. implying yeah, but, that they I, would have I saw it. That if, as a if, kind of a setup. Yeah, but like to be honest with you, if you look at if you look at the Jurassic Park universe and franchise logically, other people have the ability to clone dinosaurs. Maybe it's illegal, so maybe nobody does it publicly. They have to get into it. They point. have to explain it in this but, movie, though. You have but to have the to. thing. The thing is, is there's no if if people like Eric Kirby and Ben Hildebrand could end up on Isla Sorna. Um, sure. and on a kind of a sort of janky parasailing, um, um, parasailing, right? That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Par- parasailing tour. 
If they could do that, that means that very rich mega corporations, genetic corporations, because could easily send people onto those islands. They've probably been few... doing it for years. Yeah, too, exactly. Right? We're like at the beginning of um the Bowmans at the beginning of the Lost World. Again, if the Bowmans oh, could they accidentally, accidentally on it. if they could yeah. accidentally stumble onto Isla Sorna, then make no mistake, these mega corporations could easily secretly get in and get out with technology, get in, get out with DNA. It had to have, if we want to take yeah. these movies seriously, it had to have happened. Maybe now, maybe it doesn't happen publicly. Maybe the public doesn't know because Engine had a, glo- like the world had a global ban outside of Engine, and Engine had a global hold on the copyrights. So it's one of those things that when Engine is around, nobody could like parade around the fact that they're doing these things. But behind closed doors, make no mistake, these animals were being sold. They were being created. Now that after the fall of Jurassic World, maybe it sort of opened up like, well, nobody's going to sue us now um, type maybe, of yeah. situation. So that, that's the way that I think that it has to be handled for it to logically make sense. And it's But as just- he says, you, it, it really does have to be emphasized. It has to be said quite blatantly yeah. in the movie or else <clears throat> I think that's happened with Where are these dinosaurs Fallen coming Kingdom. From? They got there's an it. expectation that you're supposed to know <clears throat> a lot of the stuff, whether it's from the viral sites or, you know, just, well, I don't know. I just feel like, yeah, they have to explain that one. Like, I don't think it's the expectation. It's a very that... logical explanation. Of course, if Eric Kirby and if all these other people were able to visit the, the, the islands, the times we know about, other people would have, especially people with bad intentions. So, mm-hmm. yeah, of course, that makes the most sense. And it's the most logical and that's a Jurassic Park 4 story right there. I mean, there's a prequel right there. What about the first people to get on that island after the fall of Jurassic Park? And they went away Lots with of something. Stories. Lots you know? of stories. Lots like of side the, stories. And the things story is about their experience on the island. But I don't know, there's so many opportunities for things like that. Yeah, Who's no, doing? I mean... We and know I, that Biosyn's in this. We we know this. Like, yeah, you think we'll see anything with Biosyn? Because that facility we see in the trailer, I'm almost 100% is Biosyn. It, it has to be because Lewis Dodson's in the movie. We all know this. That's yeah, no, Biosyn is it seem like Biosyn's facility, doesn't it? it who else's it facility is it going to be? Biosyn's <laughs> not a secret in this movie. It's not like okay, some good, sort good, of good. secret. Just, just, it's not like something that the studio hasn't talked about. Biosyn is in this movie. Exactly. Lewis Dodson is in this movie. I mean, there I are Lego sets. Early there are Lego sets with bios and vehicles and everything oh, that's a good like point. that. Yeah, with Malcolm um, in the truck and stuff. Uh, yeah, I wonder if I am, with bios in too. People have been yeah, thinking. I well, I mean, we I wouldn't go too solidly off of plot points from Lego sets. You know how they can be. Um, you know, yeah, of course we we yeah. <laughs> Lego um, does uh, like to Lego uh, does uh, some weird mix and matching, but um, the I think the thing is like yeah, that's got to be bios in. I I would be shocked if it's anything else other than bios in. It's got to be Biosyn. It's a so new that's a thing, big though. facility. It, it yeah, just makes it sense. It can't be engine. But th- that's it's a thing, really though. It ties into everything you're saying, though, because the but, fact that we're getting a new company, they have to explain what Lewis Dodson has been doing all these years, and we know he's been after Dodson for I, okay, so I don't, the first movie it's since gotta be, it's gotta be Link. Like, what has this guy been doing? So every, yeah, you ha- they have to explain something. I don't think I this is the it. opening of Dominion, but... This is my dream opening of Dominion, just in case it is. Oh, so totally um, is, then. Okay, cool. Ev- every, no, 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 no. I really don't think it is, so don't get your hopes up. Um, but every <laughs> Jurassic World movie, not every Jurassic World, every Jurassic Park movie and Jurassic World movie in theory has opened up with an, an inciting incident. Something that sort of takes yes. place before the main action and really kicks off the tone and story of the movie, of everything that kicks off. Considering Biosyn is such a big player in Jurassic World Dominion, and they are meant to kind of be this present like entity yep. throughout this sort of new thing, it would make sense for the inciting incident to introduce Biosyn, or should I say reintroduce? Well, introduce Biosyn and reintroduce Lewis Dodson. So I my agree. dream inciting incident then would be 1993 or 1994. Egg exactly, Chris. Biosyn, Biosyn, mm. Biosyn yes. storming Isla Nublar. Chaos Biosyn. continues. Bias and storming Isla Nublar, very yeah, low key, but they come in and they get some technology, they get some DNA, and I guess they retrieve the cryo can because that way the audience it's such a cool the audience un- will understand it. It's like in theory, logically, I don't think they would need it because you don't they need have it. all the, they have like, all that yeah. technology and DNA right there, so they don't need to get that cryo can. But the cryo can can be like cleaning up loose ends. Like they don't think that will tie back to them, and they don't think anybody will find it. But what if they're wrong? So go get that cry. Oh, espionage, man. There's a lot yeah. of. Oh, that's such a good way to. That's such a good point. Yeah. Really so the movie opens well, we up. We know. We know that that cryo can is in the movie in some capacity. That allegedly. Was 
Uh, well, well, it was posted on Instagram. It was sent to the production house in the well, UK. You yes, think, right. though, things get sent to production be houses for though. all sorts of reasons. We know of other things. We know of other things that were sent. We know of other things that were sent to the production yeah, house yeah. that didn't get used. But it is on. It is on official promotion art that is in stores right now. A rusty cryo can. I, whether or not. That's really? in the movie. So, that, so you basically, it would be the chaos continues in a way. It would be Dodson returning to the island after the Fallen's original Jurassic tweet years Park. later, man. Wow. I mean, fuck. Well, yeah, Dodson's still alive, and he still has something to do with dinosaurs at this point, as we as we are finding and out. Just imagine it, 1994, though. So we see Biosyn going in as this sort of retro company. We see them getting the can. We see them, you know, going in the island. We get a small little dinosaur sequence. It takes a place in, like, three minutes. You know, we see people do something. Oh, yeah, dude. They get off oh, the yeah. island as a dinosaur chases them off the island. And then you see, like, Dawson on the boat holding the can Dawson. and, like, everybody loading it up. And then, like, boom, it's, like, 30 years later. And then we see Dodson now clean cut. He's no longer like in the thick of things like Biosyn's a successful, legitimate company. That dark past is ancient history for him. And but, we're introduced and we're like, oh, oh no. shit, they've been making dinosaurs this whole time. But Chris, the only issue I have with that now that I think about it, it it's a little bit too close to Fallen Kingdom. It's where a bit they're close already to Fallen on the Kingdom. island retrieving DNA. It is well. It's a little bit going, too close. It's a little close, except for we're introducing a new like company. And oh, you're absolutely the, right. Trust me. Everyone in, wants in the this. sense of everyone Fallen Kingdom, this. it was only for the hybrid DNA. Whereas in this case, it's about tying up loose ends from Jurassic Park, reintroducing the character of Lewis Dawson, introducing Biosyn, and establishing. Guess what? There's other people making dinosaurs in the world. I think that that's like the real, the real important part of it all. Yeah, I'm excited. I just, I, I just want to see. I just hope they don't make like Biosyn like the big bad who's been behind everything from the start. You know? I oh no, no, I, yeah, I don't want them to be the. No, I, hope I don't, they don't want do Biosyn that. to be, be behind really too generic. anything. Yeah, it's like oh, it was no, our Bi- fault. The Indominus Rex killed everyone. Oh, Henry Wu's been mm-hmm. working with us the entire time. Like no, 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 no. Please do. don't. Yeah, that would be that's honestly that's that's kind of awful. Um, yeah, yeah. Too no, cheesy. I really too cliche. Everyone's done it before. We've seen this a thousand times. We don't want to see it again. It's actually not for Jurassic. I, I hope that they do give some context for Lewis Dodge, and I'm sure they will introduce him. I would love that to be an opening scene. We didn't see him in the trailer. In fact, I think that's one of the most important notes about the trailer is that there are no yes. villains or uh, yeah, villainous characters in it. It all does seem to mm-hmm. be you know, the main uh, lead characters or, you know, it's a celebration. You don't want the negative. You want the positive. You you want to see all the good characters. It's a celebration of the franchise. You want to have an uplifting trailer. I don't need to see some bad guys. I want to see Ellie. I want to see Owen. I get, I get why the trailer did what it did, but it wouldn't have hurt to see, you know, what's what's Dotson doing in the boardroom. I don't think the franchise needs to lean too heavily on bad guys, to be honest. But Dotson's the only like established bad guy though. Yeah, in the books, sure. But the problem is, is the Jurassic even in the movies, first movie though. Yeah, Louis yeah, Dodson, well, people know of him though. Bad guy. He's, I mean, he's, he's stealing. He's True. doing corporate espionage. He's not like a villainous murderer. That's a bad thing. Like, For all we, you kids listening, don't do that. Not yeah, don't do corporate Louis espionage. Hale. But I'm just saying, like the Jurassic World That's films. But we've had Hoskins. We've had Mills. We've had um, Wheatley. So like, I almost. Sure, but- in a lot of ways, I would almost want Dodson to not be that type of character, even though he is in the books, just because, you know, I think that it's time just to get back into that real world element where, like, Nedry, he doesn't try to kill anybody. He just tries to steal technology. And oh, no, no. Dodson's wrong. not going to kill anyone. Yeah, I just expect, so, like, a super evil, a super smart, like, charismatic, evil Steve Jobs kind of guy. You I know? Don't, like, yeah, I don't want him to even be Jobs. evil. He has well. to be charismatic, though. That's a yeah. big thing. He has to be like, mustache twirling you got to have a little bit of charisma behind him like oh this lewis dodson guy not too bad maybe bios yeah. is okay and then i don't want to some some weird whatever you know well do we is. think he's gonna be in the thick of it in this movie like his character in the lost world do we think he's gonna be like in the jungle not if he's too like, old i think no because if they've got a facility i guess he doesn't really need to like it's gonna be a lot more like, hey, I'm in control. And, like offices. yeah yeah like the I overarching, guess. like the emperor kind of, kind of you know kind of he has, a like, missed a lot, opportunity you know? though bringing dodson back let's get some yeah we got rain delacour to get eaten though Rain Rain I <laughs> um, gotta get eaten. He's the mills. Um, yeah, no, I just, I guess, like, what's cool about the trailer, though, is it does. It's just more about these characters reacting to dinosaurs are now off the islands. They're in our world. And obviously, there's more going on behind the scenes to inspire them to take action and do whatever they're doing and whatever happens. But, like, the, the trailer, the big premise of this movie is they're in our world now. Whether or not that's, like, the plot of the movie, I don't know. But it, it, it definitely... It's something that people have wanted for a long time. 
and it's something it, it new leans into it seen. very nicely. Hopefully, it's done better than the Lost World. That's all I'll say. No T Rex in the city, please. And thank get you. out of here, Assis. Um, don't worry, guys. I'm on it. He won't be on the podcast anymore. <laughs> not not <laughs> my that. final podcast. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. But either way, I mean, really great trailer. I was really taken aback by how um, how little this spoiler how little this spoiler trailed me how uh little this trailer spoiled me in terms of the movie uh, we <laughs> to know to be fair when we see the movie we might be like oh it showed too much but right uh, now maybe. I feel like it showed, it yeah dangerous. but i think it showed a lot visually but it didn't tell us a lot we don't know what the hell is going on in this movie so i think that's great um, yeah. my my only thing that didn't excite me in the movie was the malta bike chase across a raptor yeah. mission impossible stuff i just sure. it doesn't really feel jurassic and that's fine the franchise is trying to do new stuff but uh that one wasn't for me the only part but that I doesn't work found, for me i also found owen on his bike riding with raptors in jurassic world really dumb so well yeah well that's because he's riding with them i like the idea that he's being chased by raptors being chased, this time. Chasing school. Chasing but the, the part that doesn't work for me is when he rounds the corner and there's just this giant carnotaurus and this giant allosaurus in the middle of a pristine city square just surrounded by people <laughs> reacting to it like they just appeared out of thin air and like somehow they're in the middle of people and they're reacting to it like it is, that's the one scene that just doesn't like like i'm like well, that's a little silly looking. That's the one part that I was like, I like no. kind of snapped out. And for it being one part and one part only, that's pretty good. Yeah. And what was that piece as well? There was that other thing. Uh, there, there's a piece of marketing. It was like a little badge poster. And it was like Carnotaurus versus, uh, was it Giga or? Car- no, Carnotaurus versus Allosaurus. And it was like, it. And, it uh, even says like Malta Fight Ring. <laughs> Malta Fight Ring. Yeah. And I was just, there's something about that that really excited me. Um, just seemed really cool like i love that kind of in-universe uh marketing angle there and just something about dinosaur fighting uh like yeah 100 percent. that would something that would happen this black yeah. market the, the the fighting ring i'm all about that like that is so realistic and i think that's such a good way of uh introducing the world of dominion to the audience is being like well we're now at a point in time in this movie where dinosaurs aren't just known about they're not just something that certain people have uh you can just go and pay money and go see them fight like that yeah. that's now an active thing uh, and it's a popular yeah, thing it's being fighting. advertised in malta so yeah Maybe. that's really exciting it makes and- a completely different uh, tune for a Jurassic movie, and I really hope yep. it's executed well. Hope we see some dinosaurs get ripped apart as well. That's going to be really exciting. I'm sure, we'll see some people get ripped. I do hope that uh, <laughs> Dominion manages to top Mills's arm just being chomped off because that that I'm uh, not Mills uh, Wheatley's arms arm being chomped off. I do hope that we get a really good kill in Dominion. That is the one thing that I really really hope for um, is like a good dismemberment. We need it. We need, we yeah. need a good dismemberment. The the you know the we best Jurassic's the best Jurassic's have some um, detached limbs. Is uh, yeah. well except except for Fallen Kingdom, so maybe not. Just like Star but, Wars. You know. <laughs> um, oh, Fallen Kingdom has detached limbs though. It, yeah, I was gonna say one. it does have. What you trying to say? Limbs. Okay, 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 okay. So, um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I just you know it'd be kind of fun. I don't know how they can up the ante with keeping it like PG thirteen, um, but I think there's always probably some sort of fun way to get like a fun like a fun dinosaur eating somebody. I just think the kind of build up to the death, um, the, the, the same way if you look at the Dilophosaurus scene in Jurassic Park, mm-hmm. the build up to that and then the eventual payoff, the eventual death, the payoff is you don't see it. Uh, you don't, you really don't see anything yeah. in that scene. You see it him works. get splattered with mud on his yeah. face. Less is more. Where it's not mud. Uh, you know, brown stuff all over his face. And then you see him get in the car and like, look, like I'm going to die. And then the ca- the camera's completely outside the car and it's fucked up. You can't see a thing. Yeah. It's a perfect way of doing it. And, but it's terrifying because it really built it up. You're like, yeah. less is more a lot of times. This whole time. He's like playing with Nedry the whole time. And I think uh, I want to see Dominion tackle things like that, especially with the introduction of the Dilophosaurus, reintroduction of the Dilophosaurus. Um, as so it screams probably- into Claire's face screams into claire's face as she scared as she screams back now i think you chris mentioned that this feels very b movie um <laughs> and not in a bad way but it seems well, very like it's kind of B movie <laughs> vibe. you could think like the carnosaur movies or something i, yeah. I, 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 
I totally see it. I totally get it. I'm totally all for it. That shot is awesome. I don't know what it's like. It sort of like harkens back to old puppeteering. It feels. I like. It looks pre Jurassic Park. (laughs) It wasn't the intention, but they managed to make it look like an an adaptation of like Arthur Conan, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Lost World or something. (laughs) It's got a real non Jurassic feel, but also it's the Jurassic Dilo. So I don't. Yeah, I still think that the. If there's ever a case for something to get a CG overlay, it's probably that one dial officer. Wow, there. Chris is now um, gone from loving feathers to getting feathers. Now he's against animatronics, fall for CGI. Just, what is going well, on? I mean, I'm all for animatronics when they work, but that was just like a wow. little too I mean, close. Obviously, we need to a see a little it too flatly lit. We got to see it moving uh, around. Its more. eyes look like they're like like it just look stone. Um, it, it, yeah, if you watch the scene in Jurassic Park, obviously it's lit differently, but if you watch that scene, the eyes and everything, the, the Dilophosaurus is just acting more like a real animal compared to the, the... But we saw it for, what, two seconds in the trailer? Two seconds. We Not even that, yeah. There's, like, there's barely saw it. Oh, so, yeah. And I'm sure it will look better in the movie. It also, oh, for sure. I think that's just one uh, bad shot because even the one from on, up front looks better. Yeah, and I do think, like, as well... Uh, It'll always that will always be something that I think is just, it will just be I'll just be able to accept it regardless of how it turns out because it just looks so fun that whole scene of Claire <laughs> screaming in the Dilo's face as it's like screams back. At her. I wonder oh, if it is like, oh, like just a know. shock to see her. What if it's a gag where like they're both like, bah! <laughs> like oh god yeah. But like, she fell out of I a tree. It... She fell out of a tree and it's like what the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> And then it runs oh, off. Yeah, it scampers off. the only off. time we see a dial-off source. Oh, could you imagine? <laughs> um, it doesn't even kill anyone. Uh, <laughs> no, they should They should give it the death of Nedry in the novel. I think that would be really good. I think that would be exceptionally graphic and disgusting. Have you, You've read the novel. You've, you remember the scene, Nedry's oh, death? Oh, big fans. <laughs> very, pretty, very I don't graphic. think you could ever show that, like, being disemboweled, picked up no, by No, I don't want it. He's like oh, holding man. his intestines. The and intestines. Like, what is this? Oh, what is this? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, not, God, damn, that's, that's not great. the Jurassic films. That is Jurassic like books and Jurassic, Jurassic films are Sci- definitely g- different entities. Video games, maybe spin-off stories. I, I yeah, accept it. You can not maybe main, get away with it. Not the main it. movies. It's too graphic for the main. I want to see a man hold his goddamn movies. bowels. Yeah, I want to see him hold his guts <laughs> at the fate of a Dilophosaurus. Like it's a, it's a dinosaur for God's sake. It's gonna rip you apart. I want to see a oh, raptor man. like rip someone's face off. <laughs> I still, I can't believe we've never seen like a pack of raptors hunt in a Jurassic film. Like there was a TV show that came out just after Planet Earth Two called The Hunt. The it was a short thing. Yes, I've heard with, of it. Uh, it was a short series with Richard Attenborough narrating again, but it was just about. It was literally about animals in the wild and their hunting patterns. And I remember watching it, and I was probably stoned. And I remember watching the show, <laughs> and. Like I think it was cheetahs or something hunting in the wild, yeah. and they they were sprinting in the desert and or like you know on the plane. And I just like I was like replace them with raptors. You have this insane hunting scene. And then I was like, po- this was pre Fallen Kingdom. I was like post Jurassic World. Imagine if there were sections of the Earth where they had like like I'm talking miles and miles and miles of land where they would like section things off, and then you you could like pay money and go in there and like either experience watching them hunt the dinosaurs from a safe distance or I don't know, some experience like that. Like I just thought that would be such an incredible opportunity to open a Jurassic movie with Velociraptor hun- like hunting, like an attack pattern of raptors. Yeah. Watching them like close in like the way, like you see in planet earth with like the wolves closing on the bison where they kind of pull, exactly. like there's someone exactly. in the back and they pull in from the sides. Seeing Velociraptors make a successful hunt, seeing the pack do a hunt, especially um, would be such a cool payoff. See, uh, and it doesn't need to be. Pe- I would actually like to see them hunting an animal for food rather than it being like, oh, they're chasing people. I would love to see Velociraptors like hunting a herd of Parasaurolophus and make a kill or something along those lines. Doesn't need to be too graphic, just enough that we see their hunting pattern, them jump on the back, then clutch on the back, make the kill, and see these smaller animals bring down such a larger animal. Yeah. Any final thoughts on the Triloroses? I have to run, unfortunately. Duty calls, as they say. So Chris and Jack will finish this up. But I will say, Jurassic World Dominion, man, I don't want to see another trailer. I like. I think they're doing a good job. So I just want to wrap up my thoughts. Trailer looks amazing. I'm very excited for it. And 
I just hope they keep reusing the same footage, maybe adding a little bit more here and there, but just don't show any more. You guys have shown exactly what we need to see, and that's all we need. I think I agree. It is one it's, more. They've shown enough. No tra- yes, no more trailers no more. We'll, would do it. Would be perfect. <laughs> one more question happen. for you. Yes. Will you be coming to the Generation Jurassic event? This is a Jurassic World or Jurassic Outpost exclusive, everyone. <laughs> uh, if you're not sitting down, sit down. If you're driving, park your car to the side of the road. I will <laughs> be going to this. That's okay. right. The boys are back. We will uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more later on the podcast. I guess you will not. You got to run duty calls, as you said, but we'll give a little more yes. context. Enjoy the pod, guys. Yeah, it's exciting. It is very exciting. Um, not that Assis is leaving. That's sad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sad about that aspect of it. Um, no, okay, Chris, I think it's a good time. I think it's a really good time right now if you and I discuss some of the toy sets that have come out and maybe try and attribute them to the movie, what we think might happen in the movie. So, what have Mattel leaked this time? Uh, At this point, I don't even think it's leaks. I think that it's just different. Well, it's not Mattel leaking at this point. If it's leaks, it's retailers, but... They're not treating it as leaks. I mean, I don't know what the global street dates are. I know April 17th is a street date here. So you there's said a some lot of stuff has arrived in Canada now. If I went to a store mm-hmm. now, I'd be able to get some Dominion stuff. Yeah, I think it's like the equivalent of like TJ Matt. I, I essentially like win, the winners home sense places like that. Yeah, yeah. People are finding them in Canada. Um, like very <laughs> not like a few isolated. It's like the entire retail chain across the board said sell these items. I love that it's um, so early. It's not until it's, April, right? Street April seventeenth is the street date. I mean, maybe what in is Canada. <laughs> I think Mattel sent out the toys too early, and the thing is, is retailers sometimes they make these decisions. So they're like, we can't have these things clogging up our back rooms for this long. So right, as well, you got to think. A lot of the people are very disengaged. A lot of people yeah. that are going to be end up working in these stores are going to be disengaged with a job to a point that just be like, I don't give a fuck. Sure, and that explains. Going to empty this box. Put it on the fucking shelf because that's that explains <laughs> like the one offs, like the times where like, oh, I went to my one store and they had this thing on the shelf. Yeah, like like and then like I tried to buy it and then this register said it's street date locked. But like when a retail chain just like across the board, like every t- every one of these retailers you walk into, you can see find the items on the shelf and then walk out with it. That means corporate wide. Somebody sent out an email, say disregard the street date. We're selling them because we don't have the room for them. Um, And that just like how it goes sometimes um if you ship them this early and because the thing is we know they've been arriving since early february in back rooms so i think at some point they're probably sending emails like these things are clogging up our space what are we supposed to do and they're probably like we'll eat the fine just sell them we're gonna make more we're we're losing money holding on to them it doesn't spoil the movie in full it it really doesn't if you're gonna get spoiled by a toy like if you're if your movie spoiled because one toy revealed a set to you i think you have to take a step back you know, yeah, I mean, like, in the not case... that big a spoiler, and at the end of the day, like, if you're that invested, I mean, you're probably aware of the shit anyway. I don't know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> or, you know, I, I think it comes down to the fact that you can't expect street dates and retailers to respect those street dates to keep um, certain secrecy elements for a marketing rollout. Like, in the case of, like, Baby Yoda or Gragu from The Mandalorian, you know why that didn't leak? They didn't put it on merch. They didn't let merch partners know. They knew that their story would resonate better if you did not know that was coming, and they made the decision. They couldn't. They knew they couldn't have it both ways. They knew they couldn't have it be a secret and then have it on store shelves two months later. They made the determination that we will not get merchandise out for this character until a year later, but it's worth it for the surprise. And it paid off. It paid off. It, it was this massive moment that was this, you know, this powder cake moment where everyone's like, oh my God, what the hell is this? I love it. Um, and that's what made that, that's part of one of the things that made that character so big and resonate so well. And it sometimes they made, they made the decision and yeah, like you said, you can't like if you're going to be spoiled by something, then just also just comes down to them saying, then don't make the toy, don't make the toy. Um, yeah. And then if you did make the toy, don't complain that it comes out a few weeks earlier because at that point you already made the determination that it wasn't that big of a deal. Yeah, <laughs> it's just such a weird weird time, isn't it? That pre-release leading up to a movie like reminds me of. Um, do you remember the Battle at Big Rock toys? Yeah, that was they, so they, funny. and the Camp Cretaceous ones as well. They were all released in stores 
like ah, from Camp Cretaceous or Battle of Big Rock. That was two things weren't out yet. So you just got uh, kids. They didn't parents. even announce Battle of Big Rock. So like you had the toys in stores, and those weren't even breaking street date because they didn't ship them with a street date. So they're in stores like the Allosaurus and the uh, Nosutoceratops, like as seen in Jurassic World Battle of Big Rock. And then like for like three more months, Universal tried to pretend like Battle of Big Rock didn't exist. <laughs> and it was like one of those it was things such like a bad strategy just, as well. Just announce it at this point. I get it. Like they didn't know when and where they're going to do it, but just like do the good old something is coming. Stay tuned for more details. Uh, it's like it's like that general like plugging up your ears and going no 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 like I'm not going to hear you no 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 like it's like that like they're just closing their eyes, plugging their ears, and pretending like it doesn't exist because it didn't go according to their plan, and that's not a strategy. No, no, that, it, it looks worse as well. I think it, it loses any momentum. Role. All these yeah. big, all these big moments for momentum. And I get it. Sometimes things happen not the way it's planned, but you got to roll with it. You got to take action immediately and roll with it, um, so that you can captive capture and build that momentum rather than it's sort of like battle big rock. Eventually nobody cared about it when it came out because that big wow moment was like sort of over because these toys were on shelves for three months. People got annoyed by waiting for details. They weren't excited by the time it was analysis. They're like, Oh, okay. Well, why were they, why didn't they tell us like people were like, especially because it had been, everybody kind of knew about kind of knew because though. Mattel leaked it at a uh, toy fair. They're like, Oh yeah, yeah. there's a short film coming out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it really, it really wasn't. Yeah. It was, <laughs> That was bound to happen, but that was that was an interesting one. I just think with Dominion, there's some stuff coming out. Different regions of the world. You got Brazil, uh, Mexico, where things were leaking out of uh, some of those. Yeah, like, or maybe their like, street dates were just earlier. Ones, but they were real. They were just like lower detail toys. Uh, as you said, yeah, some street dates were earlier, but there were some sets that were interesting. So we had confirmation. Obviously, Kayla was in one set. That's how we had her full name, I think, right? Kayla and... K- uh, Kayla isn't in any of the Mattel sets at least. She was only in the Lego set. The la- um, that, That's right. And they gave her the, yeah. uh, the ridiculous hair. Uh, yeah, it was just like... It just was completely like the wrong hair piece. And then it was also the wrong hair color. It's like... I feel like, <laughs> I feel like they accidentally included the wrong thing. And then it was too late. And they're just like, put it on the product imagery. And hopefully nobody notices. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> God, really I, did I, don't, that, I don't understand what happened there, but that's another story for another day. Um, yeah, so there's Sonia Santos, I believe is her name, and it, she's with the Atrociraptor in the Atrociraptor cage. Which um, is Dick, Dickman like, like Lichman? Lichman? Yes. yes. Um, so her name is Sonia Santos. She has some sort of tie to the Atrociraptors. We know that also because her character has the same setup in the Lego sets where she's like holding a remote and has a Atrociraptor in a cage, like, letting it out, just like the Mattel set. So, obviously, she has some sort of tie to the Atrociraptors. Um, she's got, like, this sort of, like, evil villain version of Claire's garb in Jurassic World, where it's, like, more of, like... Imagine, like, Claire's lab coat, but then turned into, like, an evil, like, Bond villain at, like, a gala type thing. Um, <laughs> like, Because yeah. it's, like, half of it, sort of, and it's kind of... It's a fun symmetry of that. So it's like the evil, stylish villain, um, I guess. And, and or maybe she's not even evil, but there's I assume a Claire she is. with Dilophosaurus set, right? Which is obviously that scene. Um, yeah, there's a, which, yeah, it completely pays off. And I don't there's know a, what it is about the Dilophosaurus that really hearing that, you know, Claire and Dilophosaurus toy set from Mattel just sounds to me like just that dinosaur really resonates with Jurassic Park 4. Like, I guess it was always the one over those 15 years that you would have assumed would have been in the movie. Like, I guess by mm-hmm. then it was always like, it's always definitely going to be the dialogue because it hasn't been bad yet, you know? Yeah. Um, it- so it really does feel like JP4 for me. Whenever we talk about the dialogue or whenever I think about that, and now whenever I see that scene in the trailer, it, I really do get like early 2000s vibes for some reason. I don't know. It's a mixture of everything coming together, the, the animatronic, the puppeteering work, you know? But yeah, I don't know. There's something exciting about that. Um, I can't remember what other sets there were. There's Owen, Beta, and the Fox. The Fox? Yeah, the Fox. Like it was Owen, as Beta. A set. As a set, yeah. It's like Owen, Beta, and then a little fox. And the so fox weird. is painted better than some of the dinosaurs, which is kind of funny. <laughs> um, yeah, is I was looking at that. I was like, is there a Therizinosaurus toy? Definitely. Yeah, there's a ther- yeah. People have found the Therizinosaurus toy. Um, people have found the T Rex. People have found the Giganotosaurus, the super colossal one. I mean, um, they found the vehicle, the capture and crush truck. Because I guess you're going to capture right. dinosaurs and crush. There's them. the vehicle. 
the um, fucking uh, they found bios in like bus type vehicle yeah thing. i don't love it it sort of looks a little magic y and then it doesn't have any bios and logos on it so it's just sort of yeah, like yeah that's a good good analysis just, of that one it feels it's cheap it feels a bit duplo like it's weird what I find more weird is that that's the only vehicle we've had so far. And from this movie, from what we know already, there are a lot of vehicles in it, a lot more than mm-hmm. the previous two. There's a set called Malta Chase, um, right. which we've not seen, but we've seen the name. And that's definitely going to have like Owen in the motorcycle, and I'm sure an Atrociraptor with it. There's definitely um, going to be a motorcycle, but I wa- like, will they do a plane? Will they do the plane that gets attacked by the cats and do that as a set? Would they do oh, you know, any it. of the bios and stuff? Other bios and vehicles? What? You know, don't or know. would Jada come in and do some of the vehicles? What about Jada? Well, doing- we know Jada's not doing vehicles because we met for them digitally Toy Fair, and they're like, "Oh, oh yeah. they're like, oh yeah, no, we're not doing the new movie." They're like, "We just didn't." We're like, "Oh, there's vehicles in the movie." They're like, "Oh yeah, we didn't really know. We just we did this remote control vehicle for kids. Um, you like that?" And we're like, "Yeah." And it was oh, it was yeah. a very we weird new, meeting. We saw the new Batman vehicle, though. Yeah, yeah. It was a very so, weird meeting because they were just sort of like, "Yeah, we didn't really think that this movie was like we would have anything to do with it, so we didn't do anything with it." Um, and it was just it was awkward. They're like, "Yeah, we're just not doing the new movie." And we're like, "Okay." So nobody's yeah. doing vehicles for Jurassic World Dominion. That's a bummer. I except for Lego. Might change when the movie comes out. I mean, the the one thing for me is that plane. I don't know what type of plane it was, but uh, you know, the one that gets attacked by the cats. Man, you imagine a diecast model of that with the cats on top of it? That would be cool. I don't think anybody would Prime do Mod it. Studios, maybe, but it would be like a thousand bucks. I'm fine with that. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, before I moved to Canada, I remember saying on a podcast, "I'm definitely buying that Prime One Spinosaurus <laughs> statue. I'm definitely buying. It. I have to buy it. Why can I not? I, I never bought it, and I couldn't afford it." Now I yeah. can't. <laughs> that was yeah. that. You know, have they? And do we know anything about them? Obviously, we know Mattel, but do we know anybody who's got a collectible license for Dominion? Um, I I think that Prime One and Iron Studios still have their licenses. Prime and Iron, okay, yeah, yeah. I think that there's going to be some really cool sets there. I mean, the opportunity. The thing is, is after what happened with Chronicle, I don't know what <laughs> sort of legal legal kerfuffle that caused because like they stopped sort of advertising collectibles like universal kind of stopped pushing like the collectible stuff in the u.s so like i don't know if there's still like outstanding contracts that like they're just waiting for them to like close if there's like some sort of weird stuff in the background that kind of stopped them from but my hope is maybe once that all comes to a close either sideshow properly teams up with chronicle i'm not chronicle sideshow properly teams up with prime one or properly teams up with iron or sideshow says hey we got the license um because it's like still kind of hard to get these things and like yeah i think there's there's two issues here right so um you know this community is full of collectors and there's so many people with such incredible collections and with everything mattel have been introducing i mean it's a gold mine right now for jurassic collectors it's it's the best time to be one. Also the worst for money, but the best because there's so much. And you're getting it at cost price. In three years, it's going to be worth more, a lot of this stuff. You know, think of it that way. If, if you are a collector, buy fucking now. Buy as much as you can now because you'll regret it later when one specific figure, like like RJ's Lost World figure, was always so expensive like to get compared to everything else. The same with like, it just increases in value. You never know. But... The one thing that always bothered me was uh, you could never get like an accurate portrayal of the vehicles and die cats mm-hmm. form, but you could walk into any store or go on Amazon or any online retailer. I mean, you could go on AliExpress right now and buy a Back to the Future vehicle, a replica die cast of each each movie's vehicle, DeLorean, mm-hmm. for $20 Canadian. It's so, so 15 American. And it's so good. Like... It's so accurate. It looks like a $150 die cast. And I just don't understand why Jurassic has never got that. And then uh, I've I can tell I've you this why. argument on the pod before. But Jada had the license. Jada did some accurate die casts. And they weren't Semi- accurate. They weren't I know exactly. They weren't off. accurate. They were like, they were like, okay, we're going to do them as die casts. But we're just going to take the random ass vehicles that were sort of like similar to the ones in the movie. And we're just going to call it a day. So we're going to like take a modern jeep pretend like it's the old jeep paint it sort of right but sort of wrong and call it a day take yeah. take a random pickup truck and put a blue stripe on it um yeah. 
uh, you know, it's like, where's just, it's very frustrating. And that's why I was hoping Mattel and like, okay. So to answer your question, yeah, the reason why he get that for back to the future is because like, what is back to the future? It's the characters and the vehicles vehicles are then going to sell. But in terms of Jurassic, when retailers say, Oh, we want Jurassic toys when it's not a dinosaur, they're like, yeah, but Jurassic is dinosaurs. We just want to commit to the dinosaurs. And that's really what it comes down to. It's not that those things don't sell. It's just the dinosaurs sell better. So I, any, I spot, it, any also... spot on the shelf, but the, then it's sort of up to the toy companies to go, okay, let's package these with dinosaurs to get them to carry them. And let's make sure that there's something that are going to be compelling. Like, this which you can't see if you're but, but not that's jacked, talking but about holding toy, the explorer. but that's talking about toys toys like patel mm-hmm. toys i'm talking about we're talking about jada yeah i know i know they i think it still toys, comes down I'm talking about accurate die cast and i know i know you're, you're totally right in that regard but also like the jurassic vehicles is, uh, if you think about like iconic movie vehicles they're always in the top 10 list so mm-hmm. we've reached a point where this movie is nearly 30 years old it's, it's got the top 10 vehicles and it does not have representation in collectible form. There should yeah. be accurate diecast. And we were, uh, yeah, I'll, we can talk about this. We were on a call with Jada and we were very excited to learn about what they were going to be doing. And we'd heard rumors of an explorer. Um, and I was like, look, Jada might get it right. All their other stuff is really accurate. They just let the ball drop with Jurassic World for some reason. Probably budgetary. I, just didn't want to I mean, it. so did Hasbro. So did so Hasbro. Did Hasbro so did everybody. But and Hasbro then, does some great stuff usually. So it's Jada like. Jada showed us on the call. They were like, okay, well, we've got this Batmobile. And it was this incredible, incredibly accurate Batmobile from the movie. And it had lights, LED lights. And I was like, okay, you're doing that with the Jurassic vehicles, right? And she was like, no, 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 no plans. And I, just do that. Oh my God. Sell the Explorer, mint condition with literally a button to flick on lights and it, people will go crazy for it and they will it's an iconic vehicle it's jurassic park like we talked to a kid on reveal to be fair movie it's th- was the first one and he's a child now in today's world so jurassic world revealed real quick what is that <laughs> jurassic world revealed our australian version of beyond the gates but it's not quite beyond the game. So it's very much a similar parable. Parable. Um, <laughs> it's very it's very parallel to um, what Beyond the Gates is um, in the sense that it is in Australia. It is tied to the retailer Big W. And Big W is really committing to Jurassic. And they've got a lot of great Jurassic products that they're going to be putting available for pre-order in Australia um, this year. And this show is a fun way to highlight those products, to let you know about the products, to show them off, and to kind of drive awareness about, hey, these you don't have to import these. They are available in Australia, and also you can pre-order them in advance to guarantee them for your collections. And that's great because a lot of people are like, yeah, I wanted the Ford Explorer set, but I couldn't get it in Australia. And then like, or to get it, it was going to be like 125 US dollars to import or something like that. Well, now you know, hey, guess what? The Apatosaurus, the Ford Explorer, they're available in Australia through Big W. And then this show we had a lot of fun with because we wanted to make it somewhat like the old toy commercials where they're somewhat in world. We wanted to dive a little bit deeper. We watched a the- lot of uh, Lost World toy commercials on this one. Yeah. And, again, and you can't see it now. We keep referencing, but we do this podcast. We have video on. And uh, Chris, <laughs> he sat in the Jurassic World Revealed set. If you go look at it, it's basically Ludlow's tent. And that's yeah, what we that was the that. goal. That yeah. was the goal. We re- recreated something like Ludlow's tent, but a little bit more modernized. But the idea is, is that we're field researchers. We're out, you know, dinosaurs are in our world now. So we're out there in the field investigating these dinosaur sightings that are, t- or characters or whatnot that are tied to the toy sets that are available and it's sort of in world. And then you go into this like kind of field report where it's Jack's voice narrating the field report and you get like the historical of the, uh, you know, maybe information about the dinosaur, like the Apatosaurus, the sort of canon information intermixed with shots from the films and shots of the toys. And it's sort of like this just... We're trying in... to have fun with how we shoot the toys as well compared to Beyond the Gates, which we have fun with Beyond the Gates. That's some of the... It's so fun filming some of those sets. But with Reveal... We wanted really this to be different. To mix it up and even more cinematic and really try and replicate scenes from the movie, but also show the dinosaur in your environment. So with the Apatosaurus, mm-hmm. we were lucky enough 
take it out in the snow, in the get snow. some snow shots, and take it out and create some jungle shots. The whole th- the whole show with our kind of goal was to kind of put it in this sort of declassified information or classified information sort of envelope, where it's all like through the lens of like a camera, all through the lens of like re- like through the POV of like cameras or files. So like our intro that we created with um, Digital Duck, um, who helped do the siege who did the cgi who helped bring this to life or mainly brought it to life brought this crazy idea to life um is like you know so we're opening in this desert and there's this fossil in the ground and we realize we're shot from the pov of a drone and it's rising up and then the wind blows over and we reveal the logo so it's obviously not in universe but then the drone gets attacked by pteranodons screen shatters we cut to static boom then the host comes out of the static and we're looking at it through the pov of a camera we got a hud then we zoom into the like the computer hud there's all we created all these crazy graphics and just did all this wild yeah, stuff. yeah influences and- from we were looking back at the old uh, my favorite game the lost world playstation game they had these incredible booting up sequences for each mission you remember hunter of lost raptor tyrant's Rift. and those uh they're like within a ui they're like ingen's dinosaur ui uh, like back end system kind of thing, and they're showing data, and they've got graphs and imagery and uh, 3D like models of the dinosaurs. We try to replicate that kind of thing, but in a completely modern Jurassic World way, just like got taking my, inspiration from them. And got also some little Easter Jurassic eggs World here and map. there. You know, I've got my love of Halo sort of reflected in a very, very subtle but very organic way in the cgi intro i'm sure tom if you're listening to this you'll know exactly what we're talking about (laughs) you might be the only one but you'll know exactly what we're talking about um uh it just it was a very fun and complicated complex visually complex there was a lot of work that went into bringing like bringing the set to life bringing the visuals to life and we wanted to just like we said like just the old toy commercials and it's living on big w right now jurassic world revealed um and it's, so, it's right. a really fun it's a really fun thing it's really a great opportunity just to see uh the toys as well i mean to americans and, and people outside of australia you've seen these sets before there are some for really now exciting, there for might now, be some things some that really yeah. exciting things coming but uh you've seen these sets but i mean see them again see these oh. sets in like I mean, we shot some really also, good stuff, and for what I'm it's really worth, happy with some of that footage. So, like, check it out; it's fun. And for the lore fiends, obviously, like our like self filmed elements aren't canon or whatever. But for when we're talking about the dinosaurs or we're talking about the historical elements, we follow the franchise guidebook. We follow, you know, we follow the canon. We we have access to materials and we're making sure so for canon connoisseurs if you want to hear like these little bits that jack narrate that is based on the canon everything else isn't canon but that is all pulled from the story bible and the timeline so to speak so uh, there might be little nuggets for people out there and little easter eggs again the videos aren't canon we even got to create our own little um investigative agency what 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 did we call it jurassic world what's what's our logo say investigative agency is that it what the final was? Yeah, there were a bunch uh, of changes. Uh, hold on, wait. I think that we changed it again. You know, there was... Oh, okay, Investigative Agency. Jurassic World IA. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, it is just, we got to create our own little um, Jurassic logo and organization. And yeah, I don't know. It was a lot ultimately, of fun. Ultimately, we, we do... Yeah, we had a lot of fun with it. It was very like, stressful. We had a lot of fun with it. But we do hope that it kind of resonates <laughs> with... Uh, the we're gonna have fun with like the little fans in australia enjoy it and that it is you know and exactly it's not just it the reasons that we you know we wanted them to it's living on big w's youtube channel so it's a chance just to get these toys in front of fresh eyes that aren't super fans the idea is this is going to be in front of casual people that aren't necessarily the people that are listening to this podcast this is just going to put the toys in front of eyes give them like a fun thing it's definitely aimed at younger audiences and and collectors the collectors is just for awareness the younger audiences it's for fun and it's just to raise awareness about these items and show them off to some new people that maybe aren't the super fans that only know what's available in australia only know what's available in big w so you have to understand this is a wide envelope that we're a big net that we're trying to cast um with it and we've had a lot of fun working on it and it's been a lot of work and we've been very busy working on this and beyond the gates um can we talk about beyond the gates i'm so you know what i'm so excited about beyond the gates episode three dropped last week phil tippett phil fucking tippett come on man that is (laughs) what a guy without 
<laughs> if if you to, to anybody that's listening who doesn't know what Beyond the Gates is, and, f- and fair enough, you're not into toys. It makes sense. It's a toy reveal show for Target's upcoming items that are exclusive to Target in the US only. Should emphasize these items are not exclusive to the US Target worldwide. It literally you can get them anywhere else in the world if that if that region has chose to sell those toys in the mm-hmm. US. They are exclusive to Target. There's Targets everywhere in the US. <laughs> um, a, yeah, Beyond the Gates is a show for Target. Beyond, Exactly. It's Just like show, revealed as a big W. We, <clears throat> we were lucky enough. We did our first season and we were lucky enough to get a second. And we really wanted to kind of do what we wanted to the first season and bring in talent from the movies to also mm-hmm. talk about these toys. So imagine, you know. We're um, not talking about the toys, but talk about the items. From, yeah. To tie like some movie behind it the scenes with toys. Together. So it's like you learn a bit. Yeah. It, figuring that out can be difficult. So what's cool is we have full. I mean, barring approval, we have really, they trust us with creative control. We go into these interviews by ourselves. We sit down with them. We ask our questions. We get like 60 minutes of interview footage. And then you and I go back through it and we listen to it and we go, okay, what will work? And then, then While we get cutting to it up with the interview. The other thing, and, uh, and like and what like narrative do we up. spin? What do we, we just let them talk. And then we figure out how to carve a narrative out of it. And um, Cause they say, yeah, that's the thing. It's for everybody's different, right? So everybody talks differently. John Bell's interview, for example, which again, an honor to speak to John Bell. Yeah, John was a lot of fun. What a guy. Uh, was completely different to Phil Tippett's interview because Phil Tippett, lovely, amazing person to speak to, just, just a completely we, different person to John Bell. So you, you it's candidly, very difficult. candidly, we got so wrapped up when we were talking to him. We we're like, oh, this is great. We were just talking to him, and we had such a great conversation <laughs> yeah. with him. And we were just like, if it were a podcast, it would be fantastic. We went to edit it into the episode, and we're like, it's really hard to tie this to the toy. <laughs> Such a it is really. Conversation. It was a very <laughs> candid conversation, and yeah. it was such a great conversation. But like then, when we went to cut it down, even though we had like sixty minutes of Phil Tippett just talking and being really open and fun and just informative, tying it to Jurassic Park and tying it to the toys in a way that would work, especially in Beyond the Gates, was very complicated. And we're like, we, you and I were like, what do we do? Yeah. And we, we figured it out, but it took we a while. We figured it out. It, it did take a while. And I think one thing that really helps is the Mattel designer, who's usually Raph because he's very involved with the Jurassic line. Mm-hmm. And he is so good on camera. Raph really helps tie these episodes together. And he he is as, as much of a fan of Jurassic. Uh, it's funny, actually, that we had to uh, reshoot his interview, parts of his interview, because he, uh, in episode three, he had the Giga sat right next to him and it was way too much in the frame. And unfortunately, we're not allowed to show that in the end. We all thought it Which was Which is weird because it, it was revealed. It's revealed. But I guess like the idea was because it was living on Target.com and that wasn't the highlighted item, it would create the confusion that this item is available now. <laughs> it was now. right here next so to his face. It, it was just literally right next to him. So we're like, what do we do? What do we do? Yeah. So we, But thankfully, he worked with us. There was only a few times that he was in full frame. And he worked with us, and we just gave him, like, hey, say the same line the same way. Because normally it's just canon conversation, but we fed him the lines the first time he's had to do that. And guess what? Raph's a superstar. He did it. Yeah, and the funny thing is, as well, I think his we did, like, three takes of the rereading. I'm pretty sure on both times we used this first, the first take. take. Get it, yeah. He always gets it the first time. But it is such – it's so much fun. And, yeah, it's only two and a half minutes. That's the challenge is cutting that content down to fit the time. But uh, we feel like that comic kind of – we're trying to make them feel like featurettes to talk a little bit more about mm-hmm. the movies themselves, not necessarily the toy. Like, episode three was the kitchen encounter set. First time you see Lex figure. The first Lex figure, it's exciting. Yeah, the, I know. The, the, the episode kind of feels more about the raptors in the kitchen and that whole scenario and the scene and building the scene and the stop motion. And Phil Tippett revealed something I didn't know, that the, the actual introduction of the barking was him. Yeah, that he he introduced the barking, the concept that you know something that we associate with the Raptors so much with them looking up in the air and doing those big guttural barks. Uh, that was Phil's idea. That was something that he really wanted to bring forward, and I think that that's just something that's really cool. That's such um, a great tidbit of information. It's probably written somewhere else, but I've never heard that information before. I just thought that was very cool, and it's just great to. I mean, it makes sense. It's it, as you said, it's one of the most iconic things about the Raptors now. And you got to, it gives them an, a whole other layer of personality. It's like dogs bark, you know, animals bark to communicate. And, and what's cool is remember, again, like this sign, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about Revealed is, hey, the people that are listening to this podcast are probably the super fans. They're probably very familiar with Phil Tippett's animatics. They're very familiar with these stories. 
But for a lot of people that are watching Beyond the Gates, Jurassic World era, they've never really had the spotlight shined on these. Like, yes, they're available if you buy the Blu-ray and you watch the special features. They're available. But in terms of web content, the Jurassic World era has never really shined a light on that officially. So it's kind of new for a lot of people. And it's a new chance for these legacy players to tell their stories again and get the spotlight. And I think that that's something that's really fun. Is It's just, again, highlighting all the different layers years long of artistry both from the mattel designers or just the people that are working on the films there's so much artistry that then goes into something that you can then buy and bring home but there's really you know sometimes it's easy to look at it from a consumer point of view and yes it's a product but there's so much artistry and hard work and love and passion that goes into it and that's what we're excited about with beyond the gates is just highlighting that artistry from the mattel point of view what we're really trying to do is, is show the whole process as chris said not just from you know the toys design to the end production of the toy but from 1993 when it all began there's such a legacy such a legacy uh across multiple generations one would say sorry i'm trying to channel a cease (laughs) speaking of generations generation jurassic you want to run us through it christopher um no would you like to run us through it Jack? absolutely not not doing it okay well, then we're not talking about it anyways thanks for coming no um hold on i'm just <laughs> pulling up the uh approved talking points just to make sure that we <laughs> approve talking points make sure we stay on <laughs> script on this one on this podcast to... we have to stay on script because universal are this is all scripted. This hour and a half long. This whole whole podcast is on script. <laughs> no, just for this event, I want to make sure that we are, um, because there's a lot of moving parts on this, a lot of partners on this, and I want to make sure that we're um, setting expectations accordingly. So Generation Jurassic is an official Jurassic World event occurring on April 28th, 2022, presented by Universal and Target. This is at Universal Studios Hollywood. Anyways, the official copy text is Universal and Target, along with superfan site Jurassic Outpost, have come together to create an event for Jurassic fans of all ages. Generation Jurassic will be held on April 28th from 7.30 p.m. to 10 p.m. at Universal Studios Hollywood. Set in the Jurassic World area of the theme park, fans will be able to celebrate all things Jurassic and experience a variety of activities, including... And uh, for some reason, the preview isn't showing, so I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it was a beautiful Including, read. give me one moment. And he certainly, he certainly, uh, you sound like the guy from Beyond the Gates. You know, I've heard that before. Um, <laughs> I only, there's like only one way I can read something without sounding dry, and it's like sounding like a cartoon character, unfortunately. <laughs> um, okay, so here's an interesting, you know what, let's get to that one last, actually. So at the event, you can try your luck with giveaways of awesome Jurassic World products. Okay. Um, Rigged. (laughs) Yeah. We actually, we're going to win all those just so you know. Yeah. We're not sharing them. We've rigged Um, them. Take part in photo opportunities with fan favorite dinosaurs and vehicles. The vehicles are courtesy of Jurassic Park Motor Pool. Jurassic Motor Pool. Um, So I'm sure you know Jurassic Motor Pool. Yes. Legends. Um, for the it's dinosaurs, not a Jurassic event if they're not there. So for the photo opportunities, again, I think that we could probably imagine that Blue, who's at the Velociraptor encounter, there will be there. Uh, as for other things, I'm not entirely certain. Um, there might be more. There might not be. I, you know, this is very fluid, and we're very much learning alongside you for a lot of these things. Not all of them, but for a lot of them, um, kids can explore the Dino Play area of the park. Um, I don't even know what that is. experience the thrills and enter the immersive jurassic world the ride so that's fun you can ride the ride the ride will still be riding how many times can i say (laughs) that's great you can ride the ride the ride will still be riding (laughs) (laughs) yeah so this is this event's after hours by the way so it's after the main park close so it's literally only only in the lower lot the um jurassic world area just so you know um, so the ride's still running. <laughs> Which they did with JP25. We got to ride the Jurassic Park ride late at night. In the dark. Yes. So that's. I'm sure there's going to be a very similar experience here. That's fun. Um, 
and there's obviously it's now Jurassic World. Redu- it's been done for redone for Jurassic World. I think that happened in 2018 or maybe 2019. I can't recall now. Um, but it's the Jurassic World revision, and I think since that's come out, they've even made more revisions. So that should be fun to see. Um, explore product displays of the latest and greatest toys, apparels, collectibles, and more. So imagine like Toy Fair, but public. Um, you know, Jurassic World Dominion. There's a huge range of products coming out. And this is going to be a great way to see it in a very cinematic and fun way. As Target is the host of this event, you can imagine that probably a lot of these things are going to be like, I mean, I imagine everything that's going to be shown will be available at Target and a lot of them will be Target exclusive. And um, participate in a live Jurassic World Beyond the Gates panel discussion, plus Q&A with toy designers from Universal, Mattel, and Funko, including the reveals of all new Target exclusive items. So you heard that right. We'll be hosting a panel, <laughs> a Beyond the Gates panel at that, which will sort of be like a live episode of Beyond the Gates, but more like a panel. <laughs> Beyond the Gates, the panel, you could call it. Return to Beyond the Gates, the panel. Beyond the Gates, the panel. It's exciting. Beyond the panel. Beyond, one thing beyond I will pa- say, uh, beyond the panel. The one thing I will say is if you are in LA, I would highly recommend coming down. Definitely come. Yeah, if you're in the area, absolutely 110%. Make sure you come to this. Um, So that's another thing to bring up. Tickets, they're RSVP, first come, first serve basis. More details will come on JurassicOutpost.com. I I mean this seriously. We're going to give you a heads up before they're available. We'll like try to say like, hey, they're going to be available at X time on X day. So just so you know, we don't know that time and day yet. But we will let you know in advance, so they're not just going to like jump up on Jurassic Outpost. But I don't know how much of a warning we might be able to give you. It might only be like 12 to 24 hours. It might be more. I'd like it to be more, but I just don't know because there's a lot of moving parts. So just keep a close eye on our social feeds, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, as well as our website. Um, you know, this information is available on our website. Um, but again, it's one of those things that if you do want to come to this, the tickets – there's limited space for this event. So once the tickets become available, make sure you jump on that immediately so that you can come. Because again, it's only in the lower the lower Jurassic World section. So you can only pack so many people in that area. Um, and then for other things at the event, yeah. Will there be other things that we're not mentioning here? Yeah. How many other things to be determined, to be announced? Um, and to be honest with you, like we said, it's very fluid. So I'm not, I'm not holding back... Um, in terms of like, I don't have any, there aren't any big secret reveals that are locked in that we're not telling you about. Um, it, it just, we'll, we'll see, we'll see where it lands. Yeah. And I think it's important to note as well, uh, as Chris <clears throat> said, there's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of things still subject to change. We, we really are not in control of a lot of that. Um, so yeah, stay tuned to the official information. That is the only thing that will be true. We obviously want the same things that other people want. And we obviously are doing saying you know we're 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 relaying what we would want but sometimes it's not as easy as that so you know it's just one of those things that we'll see where things land but all the same i'm excited for this i just want to set expectations accordingly um this is very much like you know you know if you go to comic con and they have like a jurassic world mattel like panel and like room and showcase it's like that but more celebratory with a ride and there's gonna be a lot more going on a little this and that's you know it's a little toy fair a little comic con but it's like in terms of like right now the main focus this is by target this is this is generation jurassic this is celebrating all generations of jurassic and and a lot of emphasis on merchandise um and showcasing within the park it's going to be a fun event the panel i think it's going to be exciting there i we know some some of the reveals and um, there's at least one item there that I think people are going to be very happy to see. I think people will be happy to see all the items, but there's like one item that people are going to be like, oh, shit. I'm looking forward to having a Beyond the Gates like candid conversation and going behind the scenes of how they make the toys and it not being two and a half minutes of us being able to get very candid with the um, designers and them really talk us through these stories and, and not just sound bites. I think that that's going to be exciting just to talk about the toys in not such an abbreviated format and a little bit more candid and um, less punctual. I think that that in itself will be fun. Hopefully we can get the panel online in full as well as cut downs and everything along those lines. I, I think that that in itself is something 
uh, Mattel did a panel a few years ago at Comic-Con, and that was really cool. And I think that it's exciting to do something like that again with the Beyond the Gates angle and maybe dig even a little deeper. Yeah, I think it's great. As you said, it's a great opportunity to just learn more about uh, you know everything from these talented designers and, and and every all the inspiration that came to create these figures because I mean if you're a Jurassic fan we're living in the best era for it right now so uh, yeah exciting time so episode 100 is finally here we joked about it back in the day we joked about how we oh we'll be episode 100 it's taken six seven years but we did do it in the end we got there and it was a fun episode we had the original trio on at least for most of the podcast. And uh, yeah, it's going to be exciting. In some capacity, the podcast will remain through Dominion and through the movies released. There is so much coming, um, but stay tuned. And if you enjoyed uh, what you, if you saw Jurassic World revealed, then stay tuned. There's some really exciting stuff coming for that. And we're, we're really trying to push that and be on the gates and just really trying to get some amazing Jurassic content. So we're very lucky we're to a lot be of in the fun. position we're in. And we're having we're a lot of fun really making this stuff. Just make it the best we can. Not for us. Uh, for for everybody, we, we're kind of trying to treat it as if we were the end user, we were the fan, we're not the creator. Like we try and step back and look at things as like, what if I was a fan? I knew nothing about this. Like, is this good? Like, is this you know? That's what we try and do. And I think um, hopefully we got there. But uh, yeah, Dominion man, it's coming. It's coming, and we it's are very up. busy. March. It's, it's flying by because you and I are so busy, and it's funny because our jobs have basically just become Jurassic at this point. Like Outpost <laughs> has always just been um hobbyist you know what i mean it was never yeah. a job it was never profit we never like turned it into it was always like, a lot of work but it was it was, it was all, but yeah. this is just what we're doing now is this a complete it's uh, our jobs are in a very weird way working on official jurassic things and it's been very interesting just making time go by very fast and yes that means that some of our article capacities have gone down some of our podcast capacities have gone down but a little bit, yeah. I think that we definitely felt the crunch after episode ninety nine, which I although I do attribute we did ha- we had discussed breaking until the trailer, so mm-hmm. that, you know that one wasn't too bad. But as Chris said, um, it's it's been hectic, it's been busy, uh, but yeah. the podcast will remain in some capacity. We will be here, uh, I think, leading up to Dominion is exciting, especially as we don't know the true future of this franchise. Um, yeah, I yeah, there's a podcast probably it makes sense to have that after we've seen dominion what's next but really like it is something that's weighing over all of our minds even now what happens next is, We're yeah getting... is the franchise going to go into another lull is it going to quiet down for a while or i mean it's hollywood and it's a successful franchise so no i'd be shocked not, but... if they let it but i hope that the future then is handled appropriately but that's again a conversation for another day kind of exciting kind of worrying it's like in that weird point where it's like there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of cool unknown in the future but also it could just get swung in the wrong direction so it's like you know uh, you know we know where we're at and i think that we all want a little bit more but it's not a bad spot where we're at um so We've ended up in a good position. And um, Chris, thank you so much for joining me, man. Great to speak to you on a, in a podcast as well. We're not like spending the whole day on Zoom screen on sharing. Zoom screen sharing, working in an edit. Talking in our own being like, language. And... You know, is this glitch sound too loud? Okay, wait. Trim a millisecond <laughs> off of this. You now know? we can add, We usually try and fit in discussions about like Jurassic or just like discussions as fans, but there's no never any time. Um, actually, Chris, just as, as we sign off the podcast, I do want to mention, um, you, you mentioned how everything we've been doing feels very, it, it's making time feel quicker and granted yeah. it is. Like but very. The last few years, for the past few years, time has been moving quicker. Now I know there is that Since... study saying that as humans age, you know, as kids, we process things a lot quicker. Our brain mm-hmm. is firing quicker. We process things quicker. So time isn't, not even thinking about time as a kid you don't really as a kid but you're not you know you're processing things quickly you're moving on you're getting away you're just getting through so much in the day now as you get older things get slightly slower by milliseconds but they get slightly slower and now as we go through our days it's taking longer and longer so i wonder if it's if that's just life and it does feel like that or is it exceptionally slow right now and does everything just feel off has the past few years felt off to you since i mean honestly since the pandemic my perception of time my perception of time has always been funky but my perception of time has been out the window um it's been but not so much i guess like a perception of time because yeah that is it just the pandemic i mean forgetting the pandemic but the pandemic has definitely hurt 
that aspect of things if you're working from home as well it's very yeah. hard if you're not you know it screws with your your, your mental clock but uh aside from the pandemic and having to be stuck at home all the time and stuff just things have felt weird before the pandemic as well things just started to feel really weird and i don't know i feel like the past few months six months maybe things have reached a point where it just everything feels off and weird and i don't well, know do- is it just me I know. I'm not a good person to ask, though, because you and I have shared the same schedule for the past six months or so. Yeah. (laughs) Like, you know, like, literally, our experience is like 50% of our time spent the past six months was probably spent together on a call. And the other 50%, the other 40% of that time was probably spent at home and or sleeping. And it's like this 10% that we're doing other things. But like. I just, I wonder the, the, you know, everything feels off though. And it, it, it has, have, has felt off since the 2012 CERN experiment where they tried to, what were they doing? They were firing <laughs> atoms at each other to recreate what would have been the big bang, right? Imagine if, and the threat from that was a black hole, creating a black hole. Imagine if they had created a black hole and this whole time we have been slowly getting sucked into a black hole, which is why everything feels weird. Memories feel misaligned. Now everybody's misremembering stuff and time is going so fast because we're getting sucked into this black hole. Oh, jeez. I don't know, Chris. I don't think I don't think my perception of time has been screwed since 2012, but I've always had a bad perception of time. Ask my friends where I disappear for six months and then I just like hit them up like I saw them yesterday. I've always heard that my entire life. I just live in a different world than a lot of people. It could be it the could joys be of ADHD of, of events, events that haven't changed, or it could be that we're getting sucked into a black hole. So leave your thoughts down below in the comments. Chris, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Uh, check out the description for discounts with our various partners. And as always, we will see you on the next in general podcast. We'll let Caleb's beautiful music play us out. Play it off. Bye.